conversation with Noshir Kaka, the senior partner at Vikinzi, as well as uh, the co-head of their TMT practice globally. Noshir, it's such a pleasure meeting you at uh, Davos. Thank you so much for talking to Money Control. Um, I know it's only day one, but give us a sense of what you've picked up so far in terms of the uh, themes for Davos 2024 and also a sense of the mood. Thank you, Chandra. Firstly, it's lovely seeing you as well. Although I, I do say that in freezing Davos, it's uh, <laughs> it could be a bit better. But I think on the themes, uh, I think we've picked up multiple themes. Obviously, the overall theme is rebuilding trust. I think if you walk down the promenade, you'd see generative AI. AI is all over the place. I think the other one is climate change. And you hear that, uh, you see that a lot in the posters and in the conversations with people. Uh, finally, I think there are two or three topics which I think are quite important. One is resiliency. I think a lot of the conversations I've been having with CEOs and, and leaders here uh, in a world which is so uncertain with geopolitics and so on, how do you build resiliency in governments, in organizations, in institutions, and in individuals? Um, we are also actually very focused on the topic, on some interesting topics. Space is one of them. Mm -hmm. Also a topic of women's health, which is uh, we, we are going to release a report uh, later in Davos uh, on some shocking statistics uh, on that and what we could do and change on that. But all in all, I think it's it's uh, it's an interesting time, I think, for us to be here. And we'll see what the next two, three days unfold. Right. Give us a sense of the mood. Um, because, you know, again, this is yet another edition of Davos, which is coming uh, amidst, uh, you know, geopolitical tensions. There's a second war that started. Um, what do you make of the mood? So I think the mood is, if I might say, quite different depending on who you talk to, right? So I think obviously all the issues that you talk about, we are seeing four or five issues hit the world at the, at the same time. Something we've not seen in the past. Exactly, exactly. It's not geopolitics only. It's not just climate. It's the energy transition. You've seen, you know, also technology. So depending on who you ask, I think if you ask a firm and many of the startups are here on generative AI, they seem to think, you know, it's a... There's a tremendous amount of excitement. I think if you talk to the rest of the CEOs, it's a very uncertain environment, right? More uncertain than I've ever seen it before, perhaps. But um, but there is definitely optimism. There's obviously a hope on the future horizon that both the geopolitics as well as the uncertainty around the economy will die down. Right. And what are they saying about uh, India? I mean, everybody likes to call it a bright spot. And the IMF itself has said that, you know, the expected to move from fifth largest to third largest by 2027. Uh, but what are you picking up about India? I think uh, India is absolutely a bright spot. Um, I think not just from the economy perspective, but from multiple areas. Mm -hmm. And I'll just give you two, three numbers that, that were shocking to me. Uh, I think if you look to 2022, we have 7 million households in India that earn above, let's say, $35,000 a year as income. That's going to move to 30 in the next six years. Right, that seven is going to go to thirty. Second, if you look at what the government is doing on digital public infrastructure, I mean the scale of this, the speed of this, the cost of serving that um, is incredible. You've not seen that anywhere else in the world. And finally, if you just look at the digital economy in India and the outsourcing industry, which I'm sure you know uh, or you're going to talk about, I think we're seeing lots of bright spots. This is not to say that everything is great. Right, we have a lot of external uncertainty. Uh, we're fighting multiple wars in the world right now. You know, our you know we don't know what India is very dependent on oil and so on. So our balance of payments can go, or if the if there is a spike in anything. But right now, it's probably one of the most optimistic times from for outsiders looking into India that I've seen it. Right. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, the outsourcing industry, uh, Noshir. Again, you know. If you look at IT firms, they are talking about generative AI and proof of concepts that they are doing. Um, but, you know, we are also seeing many quarters of decline in headcount. Um, so, you know, again, is this an indicator of weak demand forecasting or has something fundamentally changed the link between hiring and demand, you know, which has always been there these decades? I think they're two different questions. So firstly, I think on the outsourcing industry in general, mm -hmm. we saw a halving of the growth rate last year in 2023. Uh, most most expectations is that this year will continue to be mixed, right? Um, we don't know what the growth rate is, but some people forecasted between 4 and 8%, uh, and then a rebound in 2025. 
And I think if you looked at the hiring pattern of most of these firms into 2023, so 2022 into 2023, I think most of them would say we hired a lot of people, right? And so I think the decloth you're seeing is just essentially catching up, supply catching up with where demand is. On generative AI, I think it is way too early to actually say that that's starting to affect the headcount. Um, but I do think if you think forward, I have kind of four simple numbers on generative AI when it comes to the tech services industry. It's 20, 30, 40, 80. 20% is the expansion in your TAM, the target addressable market, right? So we think there's actually new service lines, new opportunities. For example, you could never ever do a one-on-one -on -one personalized advertisement in the past, mm -hmm. which you could do now. You can actually have Jenny I to actually convert an ad and produce it. You need tech for that, mm -hmm. right? So there's an expansion of what we could do by 20%. There's absolutely a 30% productivity uh, opportunity on the table. We're going to see that. It's going to play out. We're seeing a 40% opportunity in GNA. Everything you did on the support functions, you could do it far more effectively. And finally, the reason that all these firms are going to actually move headlong into Gen AI is there's an 80 to 100% increase in developer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So actually what the firms will actually eventually, the first movers on this will reap massive advantages, of course on growth, of course on efficiency, but most importantly on your talent because that's where good talent wants to go. Right. And what will this mean for the future of, you know, engineering students, no shit? Uh, do you see, I don't know, co-pilots or LLMs replacing what coders can do? Or, you know, are, are those things exaggerated? What skills should the engineer of the future have? Very good question. So the skills for the future, for example, today, if you look at developers worldwide, not just in India, only by some estimates, only 11% can do a code review. Everyone writes code, but only 11% of people can actually do a good code review. What that means is actually if you do, and this is what we are seeing in our pilots, if you deploy Gen AI for junior developers without any training, their productivity actually goes down. It doesn't go up, it goes down, right? So the entire reskilling to actually code review, not just prompt engineering, but code review is actually a fundamental skill. Your second question is, do we anticipate a significant decline in engineering workforces. I don't personally. And the reason for that is we've seen throughout history, anything where the cost of something goes down, mm. demand goes through the roof. Mm. So I think what you're going to see is more and more software getting put into actually every single product as we see around us. But you're going to see that software being written by different companies and different individuals. Right. Um, Nushir, you know, as... Uh, I mean, we are in January 2024 and the last few weeks we have uh, been reading reports of layoffs again at tech companies, right? Um, so again, what does this indicate? Are we in for another painful cycle of tech layoffs, which in turn could impact so in sentiment for the outsourcing industry? I don't know if it's layoffs per se. I don't, uh, I don't have a sense that that is actually a predominant theme for this year. But for sure, efficiency will be there in 2024. Mm -hmm. I think the organizations have resized largely. Uh, there will always be some that continue to do that. But I think really the advantage from here on in is how does India and, and outsourcers in India actually capture this opportunity? For example, if we think about that 20% TAM expansion, right? There are many people who are after that TAM. It can be taken by a software company replacing services. It can be taken by a hyperscaler, right? It can be taken even by uh, effectively that work being completely automated. Although we see less of that. We see tasks being automated, not entire work uh, jobs. So I think the, the efficiency and effectiveness drives are going to continue through 2024 and 2025. Right. Um, finally, Noshir, um, you know, at Network 18, we've launched an AI alliance on, uh, you know, why responsible AI is vital. So I'm going to ask you um, on, you know, what you think of responsible AI, what's the one thing that you would do from a personal or a professional lens uh, to uphold responsible AI in the way you work? Absolutely. I think responsible AI is absolutely critical. And if you think about generative AI, it's given us a very powerful tool mm -hmm. and that tool can be used for good and it can be used for bad, right? And the things that you want to think about really carefully, it's bias, toxicity, hallucination yeah all right all of these are things that you actually can to a certain engineer out 
but you absolutely have to be extraordinarily careful when you're using it on privacy, on data that is useful. My simple way of thinking about responsible AI, if you're you know, a company serving clients or customers, is you should the client or customer should feel like their data is safer with you than possibly even on their own self, right? Mm -hmm. And if you do that and if you act in that way, I think consumers and companies will reward you extraordinarily. Right. On that note, thank you. And we'd like to present you with a small bookmark that we've made on building AI that cares for people and the planet. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah.